where are we economically? What can we expect this week as the Fed inflation fight forges ahead? And how will it affect our innovative 2.0 investment recommendations? Hello, winning investor nation. Ian and Amber here. So we're so glad that you've joined us on this week's Market Insights video. Uh, please remember to give us a thumbs up. If you do like this content, find it helpful that it, it actually supports this channel. And of course, please click that subscribe button and notification bell to be alerted when new videos are posted. So hello, Ian. Good to see you. How are you? Good morning, Amber. Happy Monday. I'm excited to be back in South Florida after a 1,300-mile uh, road trip with uh, two two dogs. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm glad you made it home safe and sound. Sounds like Thank a fun you. trip. <laughs> it was great. A lot of audio books, a lot of podcasts. You know, I, One observation I will make. Okay. The rumors about Florida drivers are true. They are the craziest drivers of any motorists along the eastern seaboard. The oh. average mile per hour in florida is about 10 miles per hour okay. faster in florida than it is in any other state on i-95 so oh, yeah. I'm, I'm confirming those rumors about florida drivers okay thank you for that confirmation ian i can actually attest to that i think it's in our auto insurance <laughs> we, have, yeah. okay, we pay a lot of auto insurance in florida well thanks for that okay everyone i have to just share ian for this week, we're gearing up for a very robust week of economic releases um, mm -hmm. that will actually shed more light on the current state of U.S. inflation. And, and it's really just all leading to the Federal Open Markets Committee FOMC rate decision next Wednesday, September 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so to get everyone prepared, please check out this week's U.S. economic calendar of events. There are seven major releases this week, Ian. Uh, August's Consumer Price Index month over month and year over year will post tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. August Producer Price Index Final Demand month over month will post Wednesday with a likely negative print. On Thursday, September's Empire Manufacturing will still show a contraction, but an improvement over the previous month's reading. While August month over month retail sales and month over month industrial production will post between 8.30 a.m. and 9.15 a.m. and will likely show a 0% unchanged print. And on Friday, University of Michigan Sentiment Consumer and Sentiment will post at 10 a.m. Eastern time, which is expected to show a slight uptick. Uh, so Ian, of these releases, the most notable will be August CPI reading, and mm -hmm. we're likely to see a softening in this gauge. Uh, I was actually checking Bloomberg this morning, my Bloomberg, and for CPI's month over month reading, economists are expecting a drop of 0.1%, while the year over year CPI print will likely decelerate to about 8% from 8.5% in July. Uh, and a 13% drop in gas prices in August will play a role in the projected headline CPI number, um, just cooling a bit. But as gas prices dipped, consumers likely spent uh, those saved fuel dollars on other goods and services in the retail space, especially, as you know, Ian, I don't know if, you're, if your child is ready for school yet, but back to school season has been in full uh, blast over the last few weeks. So people are maybe spending those saved dollars there. And mm -hmm. as we know, uh, where CPI is concerned, the Fed is really watching core inflation versus the headline inflation. And just to reiterate, core CPI measures the changes in prices of goods and services, excluding food and energy. So economists are really expecting a 0.4% month over month rise in August core inflation and an acceleration to 6.1% year over year from 5.9% in its previous reading. So we just are seeing uh, just we'll, the Fed will be watching core inflation and we'll see how it goes with the uh, Fed funds rate hike, uh, which is really expected next Wednesday. So what, how do you feel about this, Ian? What, what are your thoughts? I mean, what a week to come back. Yeah, it's going to be a busy <laughs> week. So <laughs> the, the CPI is probably the most important economic release of the month. Uh, mm -hmm. That and, and the jobs report that came out last week. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, or sorry, the jobs report came out two Fridays ago, not not this recent Friday, but the one before that. The thing with CPI is that remember in July, we had that 9% print and that caused a market sell-off throughout most of the summer. In August, 
you saw that the CPI came in a little less than expected. I mean, it's still above 8%. It's high, but it wasn't another 9% print. Mm -hmm. I think the market in the last week is actually rallying into the CPI, thinking it's going to be weaker than expected. And as you mentioned, that gasoline prices are down something like 13%. Mm -hmm. So the market is sort of discounting a weak CPI already. If, if it's not like a solid seven handle, mm -hmm. um, or if it's like, if it's, let's say it's eight and a half percent, I think you're going to see uh, another pullback in the market. The other thing too, to keep in mind is that the, the FOMC meeting, um, the, the rate hike that's coming this week, is going to be 75 basis points. It's, it's pretty much in the cards. That's what the futures are suggesting. That's what Wall Street is saying. And then also, if you look at like what the Wall Street Journal says, they say it's 75 basis points. And for some reason, the Fed has been leaking everything to the Wall Street Journal. So you just have to read the Wall Street Journal to find out what the Fed is going to do at the next okay. meeting. The articles have been so accurate. You know, they have some type of mole or something in there in the Fed. So, you know, we're getting 75 basis points. Um, and 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 Powell in in this Jackson Hole speech pretty much reiterated we're doing 75 basis points. But the key is going to be what are going to be rate height expectations for the next meeting in November. Right now, they're 50 basis points. Do they go to 25 after the CPI or do they go to 75? I think that's going to be the move that that traders may be watching for this week. And then also, what is the impact on the stock market? Um, you know, obviously, if we see like a 7.5 percent handle, obviously it's still very high inflation. But at least it's heading in the right direction. So as an investor, you can point to that 9% in CPI data that you saw in July and say, hey, that's the inflection point. That was peak. That's when the Fed decided we're, we're going to you know, deliver as much medicine to the system as we can to stop this from spreading. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think a 7.5% a handle or below is going to be very welcome bound for the markets, over 8%. Now you're talking about even more rate hikes. Um, uh, it, 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 you know, not doing 75 definitely this month and probably more than 50 in November if you see a higher than 8% CPI. So that's what I'll be watching for this week. And then also, you know, I think the other one this week that's interesting is going to be retail sales. How is the economy holding up in the face of higher interest rates, higher mortgage rates, higher, you know, auto uh, loan rates? And then we'll, we'll know also. A kind of a better picture on the consumer with University of Michigan sentiment, which is not as big of a deal as it was back four years ago, whenever when small businesses were really taking off and kind of being the, the driving growth engine uh, of this country when, when the sentiment numbers are really uh, important. So CPI is the big one tomorrow. I concur. And I was just checking farther out. I'm looking at Bloomberg data and mm -hmm. their economic data is actually projecting that the Fed funds rate will likely top out at 5%. Do you agree with that right now? We're at 2.5, looking at 3.25 uh, next week. Do you see 5% as the top, possibly? I, I mean, it's really hard to tell because, you know, that the, the, this, this can move really a, a, on one weak CPI print or one bad jobs report. Mm. Um, it, traditionally, the, the Fed funds have, have, to go, have had to go higher than the rate of inflation in order to bring it back down. And so that's why there are some people at the extreme saying, you know, Fed funds are going to like 9% and we're returning to the Volcker years. I don't necessarily agree with that. Mm. The other thing is that you know, the Fed's target of inflation is 2%. They might just be saying that to talk the market down, right? They've always had this 2% target. At some point, in the future, this could be in a speech, and I'm just speculating here, they could shift that inflation target to like 4%. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, that means they're not going to have to raise rates. You know, they could they could say, okay, the economy is going to be fine. We're just going to target 4% inflation. And that means that Fed funds futures are not going to, you know, eight or 9% mm -hmm. for sure it, with a higher target inflation rate. So I think that is probably more important, like what the Fed says about their target inflation rate, than, than the course of, of where Fed funds futures could could finally wind up. You know, obviously it's going to be a bad situation if Fed funds futures are at eight or nine percent, but it doesn't look like they need to go that high because inflation is already starting to cool. The mm -hmm. economy is slowing down. I mean, you look at mortgage rates, the, the housing market is the slowest it's been right now since the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, for for what the Fed is trying to do by slowing the economy down to to rein in inflation, 
it's worked so far. It's, you know, it's, 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 it, we're heading in the right direction. I, it ha they haven't finished their job yet, <laughs> but what they're doing is working. So, so I don't think we're going to need, you know, to raise rates much higher than, than four or 5%. That's probably the terminal rate. Okay. I like that. I agree. So Ian, over the near and long term, how do you see this scenario, what's happening with the Fed and inflation? How do you see this playing out for our 2.0 investments, which are really focused on the future and innovative, innovative type stocks? How do you see that playing out? You know, everyone misses this, but like when the economy slows down, it means businesses have to do more with less. And that means that a lot of the companies that we invest in are ones that are helping are being disruptive and helping businesses, you know, whether it be in in the energy markets or the or or you know in in all, using artificial intelligence to 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 better you know get a handle on let's say your risk management your financial firm. Mm -hmm. These companies allow businesses to do more with less, and that's what the investments they make in a recession. So you wind up seeing these tech and these momentum stocks bottom first in bear markets and then also have the first when when, when the bull market starts again they they greatly outperform the rest of the market a lot of cyclicals you know which are having a good year you know if you look at like oil and gas stocks they're having a great year right but you'll see over time that that tech will outperform these cyclical businesses that are based on old world technologies and, 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 you know, old world lines of businesses. And one other thing I get a question all the time, you know, why aren't we investing in strategic fortunes and oil and gas companies? Honestly, look at a chart of Exxon Mobil 20 years versus a chart of Microsoft or a chart of Apple. It's, it's the, basically the same business. There's nothing disruptive about it. The, the, there is not enough growth. So we are invested in companies that we believe over five, 10 years, can greatly outperform, even though every now and then, you know, they have a, a, a one or two bad years, mm -hmm. but you have to look at where the company and that market for the company will be five, 10 years down the road. And for me, it's all about technology that is going to increasingly become a part of our economy and part of our lives. That's right. That's right. And I couldn't agree more, Ian. And once the Fed actually feels that inflation is in check and just stops raising these rates, mm -hmm. a bull market for our stocks will ensue. The future forward innovative growth stocks for tomorrow that we actually recommend across our services like Strategic Fortunes. So I have a shameless plug here, everyone. Ian is our chief editor of Strategic Fortunes and he has like a plethora of really uh, innovative tech stocks that have potential for lucrative windfall gains uh, for those who invest early, right? like right now when prices are so discounted. And if you'd like to gain access to Ian's current list of stock recommendations, uh, please click the bull icon right here over my shoulder to get all those details. So Ian, I, good discussion on CPI. We'll have to see what happens, but it is a chock full week of economic data. <laughs> right, and and one other thing, you mm -hmm. know, everyone's like, oh, it's bear market. Like, yeah. if you've been through these bear market before, mm -hmm. bear markets before, you learn to embrace them because these are the times where your financial future is decided. You know, like the investments that you make in the bear market and how they play out in the bull market. Mm -hmm can literally change your life and you know it, it, it's sort of like if you watch like uh, any professional sporting event you know like the u.s open tennis match for mm -hmm. instance this weekend mm -hmm. uh you see these guys playing but you don't realize the amount of time that they put in to perfect their shots and their serves mm -hmm. and that really is what a bear market is like it might be longer than expected you know, but if you put the effort in and the work in now, the bull market, you know, is is when you'll be celebrating, not clamoring to chase the next hot investment trend, but getting in it before everyone else is doing that. So that's why we're focused on technologies that we believe will be disruptive over this decade. Um, and you couldn't be looking at a better opportunity than after the market has sold off and a lot of these stocks are down, you know, over 50 percent in some cases. Yeah, it's true. But it's a look at it as buying opportunity for sure. Good point, Ian. So Ian, I like to switch gears if it's okay and look at crypto. And if if you're not um if you don't know this already, winning investor nation, you can follow Ian and me on Twitter. Ian is at Invest with Ian and I am at A Lancaster Guru. And this week, Ian, we, we received a question actually just a few days ago from Will. And Will said asked via Twitter. 
if we can check out a crypto utility token called Solidus mm -hmm. AI Tech Limited and offer an opinion. So would you care to um, help Will with his question? Sure. Um, thanks, Will, for writing in. Um, you know, I would just preface this by saying that there are 20,000 cryptocurrencies. I try to read as many white papers as I can. Um, I did take a look at Solidus. There were a couple things that raised red flags for me. Uh, number one is that in the crypto markets nowadays, there are so many VC funds that it's starting to mirror what traditional markets look like. So in the traditional markets, let's say you have a startup company. Um, the first thing you do is you pitch what you do to venture capital funds and they seed you with maybe a half million dollar or a million dollars. And then you start to grow your operations um, and then you raise more startup capital. Then eventually you go public through a SPAC or an IPO. Mm -hmm. In crypto, it's always been where this scenario that you can can float a token, basically the general public, and 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 that is you know considered can be considered an investment in your business, and you don't need VC capital. But in crypto right now, there's so much venture capital investment that's coming into the space that there. You, the, 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 it's starting to mirror that that startup market, right? So you might have a startup crypto protocol mm -hmm. that gets an investment from a, a traditional venture capital firm, and then eventually will float the token to the public. When there is a new project that doesn't have VC backing, uh, for me, it's a red flag because I know these VCs see everything. If they passed over it, you know, there's nothing in there probably to, to, that I can understand better than their armies of researchers. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's sort of like, yeah, you might be kind of following what other people have done, but it's a good way to kind of weed out what's good and what's not. Now, in terms of Solidus, that was one red flag. The other red flag that I saw um, was that they are trying to raise $43 million to complete the project, which uh, was a project that was a 3.5 million euro grant to help towards completing the existing data center inter infrastructure and a scale up operations. Mm -hmm. When I read something like that, as an American investor, I try to stay as far away as possible because they are telling you that basically this is going to be a registered security. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they have not done the full SEC registration, then no exchanges in the US are going to list them. You might be able to trade it on a decentralized exchange like Uniswap, um, or you know if you're overseas, they you know, they might list it on like Binance.com or, or or other exchanges. But I just know that you know Coinbase is not going to list anything that says basically we're raising funds to help complete an infrastructure project because that is the definition of a security. You know this would this would fail the Howey test mm -hmm. in the sense that. You know, you have a company that's saying we're raising money and we're going to put it to an investment in this uh, and and we're selling you this token, which is going to be considered a security. And then all the U.S. exchanges, Coinbase, you know, Gemini will not be able to list this token. So you're not going to have that natural liquidity. So for me, you know, it's a very interesting idea, but those are just some red flags that that I would pass on. Now, in terms of how is this going to do if you buy into it? Well, you know, they, they've done some pretty good marketing. You know, you've heard about it. Their YouTube video has something like 20,000 views. So, you know, there, there are people definitely following it. I looked at some of their advisors. They have pretty big social media following. Those have worked in the past, even though, you know, it's something that you probably should avoid. Mm. Um, but it could go up, right? Like it could go up. Um, but it's not necessarily something that I would invest in because I don't have the full faith of sort of my criteria that I look at when I try to screen for these crypto picks. But thank you for sending the, uh, the idea through. I appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always happy to take a look at any any crypto projects that, that people are thinking about investing in and just give you my insights. Oh, well, Ian, I say that's good food for thought. Thank you so much for answering Will's question. Thank you, Will, for writing in. And if you do have a question up for us to answer, Ian, answer, especially on cryptos, you can post your question below in this video or email us at winninginvestordaily at banyanhill.com or visit us on Twitter. There's no more Cardano questions, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have gotten quite a few. We've answered those enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Good point. So Ian, in mega trend news, I have some pretty cool information to share with you and everyone. Uh, the electric vertical takeoff and landing, our eVTOL vehicle market just got a major boost. Uh, we've been actually covering eVTOLs and their potential market and investment growth for some time now done a video or two on them, but I'm pleased to report a big development in this space. Last week, United Airlines announced a $15 million investment in EVE Air Mobility and a, a conditional purchase agreement of 204 seat electric aircraft plus 200 options, expecting first deliveries as early as 2026. Uh, Evitals have the potential to revolutionize the commuter experience in cities around the world. Uh, per Fortune's Business Insights, the global Evital market size is expected to grow from about 1.1 billion in 2020 to 23 billion by 2028, which is a compound annual growth rate of 23%. I just say this is a mega trend to watch for certain. Would you agree, Ian? How do you feel about Evitals? We've had this discussion in the recent past. You know, like we've been asking for flying cars for so mm -hmm. long, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's always been, when are we going to get flying cars? And here are the flying cars, you know? <laughs> so yeah. it's like, it, it feels like it's finally been here. No, but but in all seriousness, mm -hmm. um, I am deathly afraid of helicopters. Mm -hmm. I just won't ride in a helicopter um, from People I've spoken to in the industry have told me that Evitals are safer because they have more rotors. So the danger in a helicopter is you have to go up and then you have to go forward. Mm -hmm. And there is that that little lag between, you know, where the rotors have to shift to to move from up to over. Mm -hmm. Whereas in all these Evitals, they're designed with a, a, a many more rotors and they use artificial intelligence to basically understand the the wind shear and 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 also the direction that it's moving to be able to lift and then go without having the same type of problem as the traditional helicopters have because they use AI to manage all these rotors. Hmm. In terms of like, you know, it's basically like flying around in a drone. Like, I, I don't know, Amber, how do you feel about a robot flying you through the skies? Hmm. So you know, I would, have, I would have to give it some time. I won't be the first yeah. one. <laughs> So I won't get in and I'll wait to see what happens, how it progresses over time. But it, it's good to see such great innovations happening in real time in our lifetime and seeing real money being invested in it, being put behind it by established companies. Absolutely. And I, I think the bigger question here, and it's something that fascinates me the most, this is like the most fascinating thing about technology, Okay, is that when there's a new technology, right, there sort of has to be like, these these guinea pig users that are going to try it first right that have like no fear or willing to take more risk mm -hmm. I mean, crypto is a great example of this you know when you had bitcoin early on there were hacks and scams and mm -hmm. you know no one knew that the, the price of bitcoin way back when was like a ten dollars then would go to like a dollar then we'd go to a hundred and then it would go back down to forty dollars like Evitals remind me of, um, did you ever hear the story of like the, the first automated elevator? No, I haven't. Please okay. Share. So, so a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. there were always elevator operators that you walked into an elevator and you literally had a guy there that would get you to your floor. Mm -hmm. And then they built automated elevators because, you know, it was cheaper for businesses to run their buildings without having an elevator operator mm -hmm. but nobody wanted to use them because they were terrified of getting in an elevator without a person right mm -hmm. and it wasn't until sometime in the 1940s there was actually a strike in new york where all the elevators operators went on strike for like six months and the city lost tens of million dollars worth of, of business because people could not get to their jobs if you worked like on the 60th floor mm -hmm. you weren't going to the office and climbing up and down those flights right mm -hmm. so um it, it, it basically launched, they had to launch a huge campaign uh, uh, about automated elevators. Wow. And, you know, there's this big red button in elevators now that like, it says like press if you need help. That's when they installed it because people thought that they had a safety feature. I don't know, like, I, I if you've ever had to press one of those buttons before, I don't know if they, they even work in most elevators. <laughs> No, but like nowadays, like, you know, we don't even mind riding in an elevator without an elevator operator. And I think that it's going to be the same thing for self-driving cars. Like initially it's going to be like, holy cow, like I don't want to ride in a self-driving car and not have somebody drive me around or no steering wheel, no brakes, mm -hmm. but there's going to be some type of crisis mm -hmm. um, situation where, you know, you just need 
people to ride in self-driving cars. And, and that was sort of what happened in the elevator where they just couldn't, people couldn't get to work. Um, and, and I think that same thing is going to happen with electric vertical and takeoff and landing vehicles where, you know, there will be some type of crisis situation and then there, it will be the solution to it. And then you'll see a proliferation of it. It'll be everywhere. Um, and so, the the elevator automated elevator always is 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 sort of the metaphor for these new technologies and you just realize like you know how stupid were these people that they wouldn't get in an elevator and and press the buttons and then one other funny thing is that the elevator industry ran campaigns with like grandmas and like little kids in elevators like if you looked in magazines there would be like photos or a picture of like a grandma and like a little kid okay because they wanted to show you how safe the elevator was like look you know it's like the grandma is taking it why are you scared to ride an automated <laughs> elevator and so um that's how the automated elevator business really took off was was basically the the, the elevator operator strike and the solution to it wow innovation creating solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. Isn't that that's amazing? Fascinating story, Ian. I really love when you give these nice stories and it's like a journey <laughs> in my imagination with you. Oh like, so I have a question for everyone watching. Would you travel in an Evital when they are out? Would you be a, an early adopter and hop in one as soon as it's out? Or would you lag and just wait a little bit longer and see how it goes? We love to know. You can post your comment below or send us an email at winninginvestordaily at bannonhill.com. So Ian, I, that was just a great story. Fascinating. Do you have anything more to share for today, for today's uh, video? Um, I think we covered pretty much everything, Amber. We went through the economic calendar this week. We talked about the Fed. Um, I think, uh, you know, we got a lot of stuff to do this week, so let's get to it. <laughs> let's get to it. Exactly. I'm watching my screen light up right now. So thank Oh, one other thing. I, I forgot. The merge is going to be happening this week. The Ethereum merge from proof of work to proof of stake. Mm -hmm. Right now, it looks like it's going to happen early Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any Ethereum investors, keep an eye out. You know, Ethereum has been up recently. There's probably going to be a, a, a hard fork, which means that if you own Ethereum, you, you will be getting free tokens from this hard fork because the miners are trying to hold on to a proof of work chain. Um, while the the rest of it, the Ethereum community moves to a proof of stake, so mm -hmm. so that's uh that is uh that's the big news this week uh, outside of what's happening in the economic calendar in crypto land. Probably the you know the, the biggest uh, development in, in in crypto for the last several years is this mm -hmm. this Ethereum merge happening Thursday morning. Right. Well, we will be watching and thank you for bringing that up, Ian. So everyone, thank you so much for tuning in this week. We appreciate you so much, Ian, me, and Alex, who's always chilling in the background. So we wish you a great week ahead, Ian. You can say goodbye and that will be it. So long. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.